Welcome to Auto Off Topic. Hi, Brad. How are you? I'm surprised you remember the name. It's been so long. It has been. Of course, if you're listening in order, it's right after the last one. If you're listening in order, not the day it comes out. Yeah. I mean, listen, we kind of go all year, and even your favorite TV show takes an entire season off. So it's true. It's two weeks. It's fine. Yeah, it, it was a long two weeks. I was um, I was in Detroit for work, and then went right through to L.A. Also, but for the work. L.A. part, yeah, also for work. But the L.A. part was cool. Detroit, um, kind of cold and gray. So, I mean, it's kind of like New England in a different yeah. location. Minus, and I know we have some listeners in Detroit. Trees. Yeah, but I was very busy. So, I mean, I had a couple of fun. So, no, although we did go one night with a bunch of people from work, we went electric go karting. That's um, cool. And everyone was shocked how fast I was. I'm like, yeah, I've done right. this before. Yeah, <laughs> this is not my first rodeo. No, although I did I see a statement have... the other day that said, I'm shocked with how much I'm supposed to know by my second rodeo, and I yeah. left for a while. <laughs> Yeah, I've got hundreds of laps in indoor go karts. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I do too, but I'm not fast. So maybe it's, maybe you're just good. I mean, the two other guys that were just slightly faster than me, I weigh as much as the two of them combined. So excellent. So they were half your age. No, they're only a couple years younger than me, but they're just much thinner. No, Andrew, they're half your age. They're children. It's fine. (laughs) I don't work with children. That doesn't make sense. Well, half your age would be old enough to work. So they're just younger and smaller. <laughs> okay. All I was right, just saying, right. don't admit that you're fat on, on the air is what I was saying. I didn't say how much they weigh and I didn't say how much I weigh. Well, theoretically, if you weigh double their weight uh, and they're not children, they're at least 100 pounds. I'd be fine with being 200 pounds. Okay, good. So so you're 200 pounds and they reach 100 pounds. Perfect. Yeah. All right, I like it. Exactly. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I always used to blame my weight on go-kart lap times, but turns out I'm just not that good. Yeah. So it's fine. Sorry. It's fine. The only place I, <laughs> I, the only place I will say I did make a difference was early days at F1 Boston where I had a hill. My weight definitely held me back on the hill. No question. Eh. But I don't know. I think it did. The um, electric definitely helps with it because there's no, the power band is just the entire power band. Yeah. If you, if you bogged down an old gas cart, they were, they took a long time to get going again. Yeah. The only thing with electric is if you slide them and they lose traction, that's actually where you lose out. Right. But they don't bog down. Well, the gas ones, you slide them, and they lose track and, they bog. and then they bog. Yeah. Which is fun to slide them, and it feels like you're taking the corner faster, but obviously you probably, no. are, you probably are going around the actual corner faster, but you've lost the momentum on exiting the corner. That's probably what the issue so is. So I saw yeah. advertising on Instagram. Certain K1s, the electric place, it's like a national chain. Yep. One they here. do do drift nights now. Okay. They like swap out. I think plastic they throw tire. like plastic tires on the things. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that sounds kind of cool. I, I would like to try that one night. It'd be a little different. Maybe but. when you come out here, we'll do a uh, K1 drift night. Yeah, as long as it's <laughs> during the week. If it's there, if they're having it, we'll I mean, you'll it be up. here more than a day. We'll figure it out. Yeah. So, anyway, where was I? Uh, we did that work trip. Yeah, so that's why. No episodes for two weeks because on the road, but we did do a bunch of cool stuff that we'll get to. Sure did. But um, you want to talk about your favorite thing in Phoenix though, which is sideshows. Yeah. So some little fallout from this now. So obviously they're lame and they're terrible, and you should not participate. Correct. I mean, it sounds like you really like them. I, I'm sure you're not. Like I'm not positive about these. Listen, I'm all about having fun in a car, but when you enter fun in the car plus mob mentality, that's when problems start to arise. So if you're having fun in a car and you're 
in your own way. You're being as safe as you can be while being dangerous. Whatever. You enter the mob mentality and you have hundreds of people and multiple cars and there's people getting hit and cars getting smashed and guns being drawn and shots being fired and it's a whole thing. There was recently here in Phoenix, a side Joe, that ended with some lady getting mad and yelling and calling the police and some guy like following to her house and like shooting up her house. So obviously that's bad. <laughs> but the fallout from these sideshows is what's bothering me right now. I mean, this is like Peter Griffin's, you know, it grinds my gears segment. So we had here in Phoenix, or actually I think it was in Tempe, there was an organized meet in a parking garage. There was not a sideshow. It was an organized meet in a parking garage. At this meet, there were, I think they said like 400 cars. And there were vendors and there were food trucks. And it was legitimately an organized meet in a parking garage. Yeah, that sounds like a car show. Yeah, at nighttime. So okay. somebody who lives near his parking garage got upset that they were all there and called the police. And the police came down and broke up this parking garage car show, which was being very quiet. In fact, if you watch videos from this parking garage car show, there was all kinds of racing going on, but it was people on foot. They were doing like foot races in the top floor for some reason. Like they were all pretty young kids. They weren't misbehaving. They were in a parking garage car show with vendors. So the police show up and they decided that they were going to do a sideshow later on in the parking garage. So they're going to break up this car show before it gets out of hand and find the guy who's organizing it and cite him for inciting, um, inciting, it was like inciting drag racing. Okay. And gave him a citation for inciting a crowd to participate in like, I I forget the exact wording, but it's basically inciting a dangerous crowd. Yeah. So that fallout is now on every car event that if you park a car with like-minded car people, you could be cited and charged with amping up a crowd to maybe go do a sideshow. And that's the kind of stuff that these sideshows are going to wind up causing an issue with because they're going to wind up making every car guy's a bad guy, right? Because some guys are bad guys. Do they have like permits and stuff? Or like you know, I don't know. I don't know the specifics. And if they did have permits, it's even worse. If they didn't, I can understand breaking up the event, or at least permission to be in. The, I suppose right. if you had permission to be on private property, you don't really need permits. Sure, maybe, maybe for the food trucks, I don't know. But anyway, yeah. re- regardless of the permitting or no permitting, if they didn't have permits and or not permission to be there, then the cops can go in and say, "Hey guys, you know, cool." Glad you're behaving. You got to leave. Have a nice night. Right? Not- yeah, there is a level of organization, though, if you've got food trucks. Yeah, it was a pretty heavy. Or- I, I mean, I saw in like I saw flyers and stuff on Instagram to go to this event. Like it wasn't I, I didn't go. I'd have been super mad if I did. It was the crowd skewed a lot younger than than my crowd. So I wasn't planning on going. Um, it sounds like that. Uh, it's like I looked it up, actually, because I was looking at photos not that long ago. Remember the mass tuning meet that was in the parking garage in downtown Boston. Yeah. It was like, it was like 2012. Yep. That sounds, that's what this sounds like. Yeah. That show got out of hand though. Yeah. Like there was a reason that the police came to that one because there was at the time <laughs> there was no such thing as legal marijuana and there was a lot of marijuana smoke. And on top of it, there was also a lot of people doing rev competitions and burnouts in the garage. Yeah. So that was bad and that deserved to get broken up. Also, in 2000 and it might, it might have been before 2012. No, it was 2012. Was it? 100% 2012. So 2012 was 10 years ago. Yeah. I guess we weren't kids then either, but we were closer to kid age. So we were there. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, I'm just upset because I don't want to go in a parking lot with a friend now and have the police come and be like, oh, I think you guys are going to go do a sideshow when you leave here. So here's a ticket. 
Like that's that's some minority report stuff. Like that's not that's not legal, I don't think, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, it bothers me. And it bothers me that because these events are becoming so popular, they're making legitimate events look bad. And especially my problem with that particular one is the writing the ticket for the guy who organized it for inciting, you know, reckless driving. Because he didn't. <laughs> like, he, he hosted a car meet and a bunch of people showed up and he had vendors. You know, it's, I don't know. I, I just, I'm a grumpy. I don't want to be grumpy. I'm grumpy. Take me out of this, Andrew. I don't like it. Well, I assume it's like the, I think it's like the 1320 thing where they would film, right? Illegal drag racing. Okay. But you're making the money off of the YouTube views and the merch. Yeah, and, and they're not assuming people. Doing. Yeah. And assuming people are doing the same thing with these sideshows. You're getting views on videos. So and... they've changed the laws here in Phoenix. They have, they call it the street racing task force. Um, yeah. It's brand new. It started last year. They actually just made it permanent. And its whole purpose is to stop sideshows and to stop drag racing on the streets. Um Unrelated topic, they just announced that the city is taking over the only drag strip in town by eminent domain next year. So I don't know how this is all going to help, but that's, you know, a tale as old as time, right? So they started this street racing task force and they have said, and they have written into law, so this is a law, that if you are at a sideshow event or an illegal drag race and you are participating or spectating you can be charged with the same crime. Just spectating it now because they want to stop it. So that's fine. It's on the books. They've made the law. I'm pretty sure there's no law where it's like, oh, you gathered a bunch of cars parked in a parking lot. You're inciting a sideshow. That's where my issue comes from. And the news channels, even they blew it out of proportion. Literally, the news channel had a video of a drone, and they're like, oh, we we snuck our drone into the show to show you what was happening. And they have literal drone footage of a parking garage with a bunch of cars parked in it, and like a taco truck, and a guy selling t-shirts. And then they cut in footage from other sideshows in the past that they had in their inventory, in like their library, to make it seem like it was a bad thing. Yeah. So Remember when Channel 7 did that to us? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. That was well before 2012. That was yeah, like that was like 2003. Was 03 to like 06 or something. Yeah, they they infiltrated our illegal drag racing crew. <laughs> it was like five of us in a parking lot. We were all literally at Kelly's Roast Beef, which is questionable in itself. Standing around, yeah, don't judge it. I wasn't eating roast beef. Yeah. I was definitely eating roast beef. Because as much as I don't like Kelly's, it's still better than no roast beef. And if everybody else is going there, you might as well have a roast beef. So, um, yeah, we're, the video is literally us all standing by our cars. Like, I think I'm leaning on either the Evo or the Talon or whatever. Like, <laughs> The guy was like across the street with like a camcorder. It's eating, really sketchy. <laughs> eating a roast beef sandwich. And they're like, we infiltrate this group of illegal street racers <laughs> gathering up to plan their races. And I was like... I'm not planning a race. It was like daylight. It's yeah. <laughs> like a Saturday afternoon. It was yeah, really weird. That was it was yeah, it was very strange. But it was very similar to that where they, you know, they busted this crew of you know, they they called them they called them something else. They called them in the news report street stunters. You know, gathering of 500 street stunters was broken up by police today. Like, oh, so now the public is like, "Oh, these guys. Screw these guys." In fact, when I heard about it in the first place, Person was like, "Why would these people go to a sideshow inside a parking garage? Because they're going to get caught. Like, there's there's no other way around it. It's like well, they weren't. They were having a parking garage meet. So, anyway, it it just, it just makes me angry that because it's becoming so pervasive, it's becoming an issue with people who aren't doing it being accused of doing it, and it's that whole one bad apple spoils the bunch, right? So, just if you see it happening, I know you can't like actively stop it, but just avoid it. Don't video it. Don't post it. I mean, just back away from it. It's bad. They're not car people. They're just people that want to make a statement on the internet. Um, 
Well, it's like those guys that rented Tesla jumped yeah, it. It's the same thing. It's just it's it's mob mentality. You know, and oh, they didn't plan that jump. Sure, sure they did. I'm sure they didn't. That's why there were 17 people there with cameras. So yeah. it's it, it's just that it's that mob mentality and that I want to be Instagram famous for a day mentality. And it's it's ruining things. Um, I think we need I to will take, say the we, thing take, about take the, that car culture. That's what we got to do. Yeah, I will say the thing about the drag strip, though, that's not great because in California, when they had really bad street racing in the 90s, and people were getting killed. What did they do? They made everybody go yeah, drag strip. to drag strips. Yeah. Yep. Like, so there's a reason. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the didn't... irony here. Like the police are busting up a car show and they're saying, oh, it's to stop street racing. So what's this, what's the city doing? Oh, we're, we're eminent domaining the drag strip so you can put a new on-ramp on. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, they used to do like race a cop and stuff yep. like that. Yep. And uh, yeah, that was. The, the longer, the longer you're around, the longer you're alive, the more you see the same things over and over again, right? You yeah. know, and like like you said, back in 2003, it was us in a parking lot being accused of being street racers. You know, and here it is, these kids now in 2022 being accused of being street stunters when all they're doing is something that's old as the car, a car meet. So, I mean, you get a bunch of people into cars, they got to go in a parking lot. So, leave them alone unless they're causing a problem. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there was, there was a movie about that. It was called Minority Report, arresting somebody before arresting somebody for thinking about committing a crime. It's basically what was happening there. And that's ugh. anyway, that's my rant for the day, Andrew. Sure. You want another rant? What else can I rant about? I don't know. What do you got? Um, have you ever heard of, let me rephrase that. Do you know that there was a Canadian automotive division that was not sold in the United States? Yeah, I think I do, uh, vaguely. Okay. So I knew this, but I always thought it was a model of a Pontiac called the Acadian. Yeah. I always thought that they were called Pontiac that was Acadians. Like a Nova? So the first generation was a Chevy 2 or Nova, and the second generation was a Chevelle-based or Malibu-based. Um, but I always... And confirmed this at work with other people who are well versed in cars. Thought that the Acadian was a model of a Pontiac only sold in Canada, because we never had a version in this country of the Chevy Two, the first generation Chevy Two in the Pontiac brand. So I was always under the assumption that the Acadian was just how GM for some reason sold them in Canada as a Pontiac, and then. There's also the Beaumont, and I thought that the Beaumont was a Beaumont Acadian. So I learned a bunch today. (laughs) We had somebody submit an Acadian to our auction site for sale. So I had to do a little research because I was having a hard time finding comparable sales by searching Pontiac Acadian. So this is a neat little GM history lesson. I could see how I got confused. So in 1962, General Motors said, we're going to make a division just for Canada, and we're going to call the brand name the Acadian. They didn't say, we're going to make a model of a Pontiac and call it an Acadian. They said, it's going to be the Acadian. And I was like, okay, interesting. And our Canadian... So they are Canadian-built General Motors vehicle called the Acadian. So yes, they are Acadian, Acadian, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Arcadian, eh? Arcadian. He's Arcadian. So then there was a car called the Beaumont, and it was a trim level on an Acadian. So now I'm thoroughly confused because A, I thought there was a Pontiac Acadian, and B, I thought there was a Pontiac Beaumont. So now I had to do some more digging. So in 1962, there was a car called the Acadian, which had a trim level called the Beaumont. In 1967, they dropped the Acadian line altogether, and the brand name, so the mark, was now Beaumont. And there were no models. It was one car. It was based on the Chevelle Malibu. 
uh, uh, 64, actually, I think. 65? Uh, I might be off in the years. 66. 66 is when it became part of the Malibu. So 62, 63, you could buy an Acadian. 64, 65, you could buy an Acadian or an Acadian Beaumont. Or 1966, now you could buy a Beaumont, but not an Acadian. That's a Chevelle. In none of this is the word Pontiac in there. Yeah. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out why I always thought they were Pontiac Acadians. So they only sold these from 1962 until 1971 under those with different names. And then they started again out of nowhere in 76 and made a car called the Pontiac Acadian that was a Chevrolet Chevette. Weird. So in the United States, we got a Pontiac version of the Chevette, but it was called the T-1000. Not Terminator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but in Canada, they didn't sell a T-1000. They sold a Pontiac Acadian just to further the muddy of the just to further muddy the waters of the Acadian name and confuse me in 2022. <laughs> was there also a Toyota pickup? What's that? The T1000. Mm, yes. Was it T1000? Yeah. The T something. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it was a T1000 because they did like a Terminator tie into it. Did they really? Yeah, Terminator 3. It was a Terminator 3 special edition Toyota pickup truck. All right. It was a T100. It wasn't a T1000. T100. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there was a Terminator tie in. I think you're making that up. <laughs> no. Because there was. You're having a fever dream. For- no, for Terminator 3. Not a very good Terminator movie. Arguably one of the worst. So there is a Toyota pickup truck tie-in to Terminator, but it has nothing to do with the T100. Okay. So right. it was a first-gen Tundra. <laughs> they did a so stupid marketing mistake right there. Yes. So they did a Toyota Tundra Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines special edition <laughs> in which... They advertised it with one red headlight, which yeah. obviously they couldn't sell it that way because you can't have forward-facing red lights. So I think it was just a sticker nope. on the quarter panel that said T3, Rise of the Machines. So You know how well movie tie-ins in cars work because it makes so much sense. Yeah, not very well. <laughs> I can't think of any that have worked well. We should do an episode about that, I think. We did one with tie-ins for different weird things, and I think we did one. With like may, we probably mentioned that, and I know we mentioned the the Rogue. Oh, we said Rogue cool. One. Yeah, we did. We did one for different advertising tie-ins early, early on in the show, um, which we could probably revisit. Yeah, I should do a Throwback Thursday episode for that one. Yeah, post it because that was a pretty funny one. We didn't do any of those, but we should have done those when he went away. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Oops. Oops. Sorry, guys. We're gonna fire that. Auto off topic vacation. <laughs> so anyway, so that's that's the Acadian history, and I now know how to look up an Acadian to check values, and uh, so does our audience. So weird. I feel like you would have found that out if you watched that Rust Valley Restores show. Yeah. Well, have you ever watched that show? <clears throat> yeah. No, oh, it's not very good, so I don't watch it. It's like. Kind of like trashy. That's it's the kind one of throw it with on the guy sometimes. with the dreadlock. The dreads. Yeah, that shows bad. Yeah, it's you, weird. You should reverse this episode and then delete that part where you admitted to watching it. I won't tell you. I said it's trashy. I don't. All right. <laughs> it's a it's a guilty pleasure. All right. Well, sometimes I haven't watched it, and uh, I've seen like I've seen enough trailers to know I didn't want to watch it. But maybe I'll uh, I'll have to give it a chance, Andrew. I'm very, I mean, I'm, I was watching it when my father-in-law was visiting and we were just making fun of it because the guy's so dumb. Okay. My father-in-law was also a mechanic. He's retired now, but he's like, what is that guy doing that for? It's so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> All right. Like, That's how you do that. We will allow it. That's okay. So I've had the same thing when watching any of those. The majority of those car shows are just like, this is. I mean, they're clearly made for the lowest common denominator. They're made for the general public who knows nothing about cars. And that's, 
don't know. That's, that's a hard one to. What's what's the one where they make terrible looking customs? Oh, got Gotham, Gotham Garage. I don't know. There's like so many. Well, there's one where they make really bad cars. And somebody the other day was like, "Oh, do you watch Gotham Garage?" And then started talking about all of the cool cars they make. And I looked them up, and I I nearly threw the computer at him. That's how offended I was that he thought I would like them. They were okay. they were very bad. Very, very bad. I, in fact, I am going to have to show them to you after this episode so you can see how bad they are. So they're second only to bad Jad's customs as terrible customs. Okay. So also, also a Canadian show. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Stop giving dumb people microphones, people. <sighs> Shit. Somebody's taking We're my still micro- here. Somebody's taking my, mic- my microphone away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not good. All right, ignore that comment. So anyway, that's your uh, uh, that's your Pontiac, not Pontiac, Acadian. So there is a Pontiac Acadian. It's just not what I thought it was, and didn't come till later. And it's a Chevette. Well, I'm glad you cleared that up for me. It's not for you. It's for the audience. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that everybody would be very interested in knowing this. That uh, there's an Acadian and a Beaumont, and a Pontiac Acadian, and the names intertwine all over the place. It's quite annoying. Uh, do you know what the SS version of the Beaumont would be called? I don't know, the Maple Leaf? No, they called it the SD-396 instead of SS-396. SD, Super Duty? Uh, it stood for Sport Deluxe. Oh. So that was the uh, the top trim version. So I like these cars. They're, they're not cheap um, because they're interesting. You know, like I said, they're essentially the same car as the Chevys, just with some different trim. Um, I think that the the Beaumonts are basically a Chevelle body with a unique grille, and then I think they have like a Pontiac dashboard, which probably also adds to the confusion. But you don't see them very often. But when you see them, they're like, it's like, oh, that Chevelle looks weird. Why? Yeah, you know, it's always why? it's weird, right? Like why? sell different cars in Canada? Like, we're so close as countries. Mm-hmm. Like, Well, I mean, we had that same thing. We had the same conversation about the, you know, the terrible naming convention of Mitsubishis over the years because we had Dodge Colts here, and then in Canada, they sold the same car, but it was a Plymouth Colt. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, that seems like a waste of time. <laughs> like, just make it a Dodge Colt. So. Well, that might have been like... Uh, amount of dealerships maybe but you know a chevy dealer is there's like chevy and pontiac dealers there's got to be in canada canada yeah yep. so why just not just sell chevys or sell pontiacs it's weird right well like, think think back to gm at the time like gm from the dawn of time until fairly recently they had so many repetitive brands like was there ever was there ever a reason for a chevy a buick a Pontiac, an Oldsmobile of the same car. Like there's never really was a reason for that. It was just a, a marketing thing where they thought, Hey, the more brands we have, the more cars we can sell. But if really, if they, if they dropped Buick or Pontiac early on and just had one of them, the same buyers probably would have bought the Pontiac or Buick, whichever one survived. Like it wouldn't have been, yeah, they wouldn't have gone to Ford to like, hold it from manufacturer. They would have bought the same car just in the Pontiac version. You know, it just, it just seems, it seems redundant and it's only, fairly recently where these brands have been like, wait a second, what are we doing? You know, Ford did it with Mercury. They're like, wait, why do we have Mercury and Ford? It's it's the same shoppers. I I get early on in American car history, you know, twenties, thirties and around. Well, you had like a, they were levels. You'd have a Lincoln, you'd have a Lincoln Mercury dealer. Well, right. So, but Ford, Lincoln, Ford, Ford, Mercury and Lincoln made sense at the time early on because your Ford was your entry level. Your Mercury was your intermediate, luxury and your Lincoln was your top of the line. But GM had Chevrolet as the entry level and Cadillac as top of the line. But then they had these three or four mid level cars that just didn't make any sense to have all of them together. And it was just Yeah, didn't it go like it was like Chevy Pontiac Oldsmobile Buick Cadillac? Um or I have Oldsmobile and Buick swapped. I mean I I guess it kinda could have. I think Buick and Olds were kind of interchangeable most of the time 
you know, Pontiac always had a little more performance than some of the other ones. Actually, not, no, they didn't, because in the 50s, Oldsmobile did. I don't know. It just it doesn't make any sense. There's no, <laughs> there was no true lineage there. It was, you know, you drove a GM car, whether it was a Chevy or a Buick, and the only difference was when you made it, you bought a Cadillac. You know, and, and the American yeah. automotive manufacturers had such a, such a, like, feelings of grandeur, such like this American car exceptionalism, like, we're the best, nobody's good as us, so we can make the same car six times and people will buy it until... People started buying Mercedes and BMWs and Hondas and like, wait a second. And they didn't even catch on until fairly recently when they started dropping these brands, you know, Chrysler, Dodge, Plymouth. Like wh why was Plymouth? Why? And then for a while, Eagle, why, why Eagle, you know, a brand without identity. Yeah. Well, anyway, well, we could debate that for years. Um, There's a debate. Speaking There's of facts. Yeah. Speaking American of car odds. manufacturers were dumb. <laughs> Speaking of odd cars that share the same guts, um, it's Sony I guts. rode in. <laughs> yeah, it's it's Sony guts. <laughs> uh, I rode in. I rode in Tony Bird's. Uh, he's a listener and and friend. He's he's got a four hundred horsepower Eclipse. Is that four hundred wheel? One G. Yeah, that's fast. Um, I think it's a ninety one. It's gonna pop like up, it. so it's yeah. ninety one. Um. And it's actually, if you watch, this is an old video now. I think it came out in like 2018 or 2017 because it was before Radwood 17. Uh, he's in the smoking tire one take. Matt Farrow drives it. Yeah, he did two Eclipse. videos. He did the 1G Eclipse one take video, and there was some like fake commercial Eclipse. he made with it too. Eclipse and all <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah. It was it's like actually kind of funny. I don't think he's, he's never done anything else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I met Tony because he lived it's not too far from where my work was and I was available and went down and had a nice dinner with him and his fiance and <clears throat> took me for a ride in the eclipse and yeah, four horsepower is really fast in one of these cars. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I've <laughs> I've ridden in a very fast eclipse. Um, you know, a car that runs nines. Um, I don't know what his horsepower to wheel is, probably somewhere there or north. Um but it's it's mind bending to be in a car that feels so familiar, but is that dumb. Yeah, and it was a super trip because we'll get to it. I was riding around in your non turbo all weekend until I yes. rode in, in Tony's car. Yeah, and we were like, "Well, the car is not not turbo, but it's quick enough to have fun." <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, one hundred and thirty horsepower, it's fine. 400 is probably a little too spicy for me for what I want to do. I want to be yep. around 300 wheel. but Which I think your car probably is somewhere between 250 and 300 wheel, right? Not right now. No. No? It has been? No. No? Your car feels really fast. Yeah, but it's not... Uh, it, <laughs> it's, it needs to be tuned. It, it's not 300 wheel now. Well, I think, it's, I think it's north of 200. I can tell you that much. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But it's not much more than the, than the Gallant right now. But maybe, anyway. I'm, maybe I'm remembering it differently because I remember that car being significantly faster than what I was used to. Yeah, it's not slow, but it, it needs some it needs some tuning. Yeah. And I'll, uh, we'll have some updates on that coming soon. But anyway, so yeah, that was a little fun thing. And then speaking of turbo all-wheel drive things, coming back, uh, of all from... Of all manufacturers. The most exciting car shocked. manufacturer in the market right now. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, truly. Uh, Toyota announced the GR Corolla. Yep. The Gazoo Racing yep. uh, Corolla. Sure so not the that. Yaris. I'm not sure of the history on Gazoo Racing. I need to figure that out. I'm not sure either. I got to look had, that up. They had this perfectly good name, TRD, and then all of a sudden they were like, no, Gazoo. Like, oh, okay. I like better because it's, it's so weird. It's very Japanese. Yeah. And it doesn't sound out turd when you look at it. No. Which is positive. So they have built, it's the current gen Corolla? It's the current gen Corolla hatch. Yep. Yep. It's got, but it's got like flared fenders now. Sure. Like box flares almost. It looks like a WRC car. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of got that body kit, but Super cool. like more of a street car. Three cylinder, turbo, manual, mm -hmm. all wheel drive, fancy diffs. No MSRP yet. 300 horsepower. 
Yeah, but mm-hmm. so it's comparable to an STI, which is dead. Yep. Or it's an all-wheel drive Civic Type R. Yeah. Um, or it's a Ford Focus RS. It's right. that same kind of level of car. So here's the one, the only reason I'm not super excited about it. All right. The car market is terrible. So, so it is terrible go right to now. a dealer and the dealer is going to mark it up and there's going to be a wait and people are going to buy them and flip them for double MSRP. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. I think back when I, I said that happens all the time now. And unfortunately I work in this industry. Um, so I'm probably part of the problem, but I see these cars being bought and not even like super exciting enthusiast cars, but I mean, even, even the Ford Mavericks are being marked up at dealers, but the enthusiast versions of cars are all being bought. And then the first buyer is immediately putting them on an auction site and flipping them and getting another 20 grand out of them, which is infuriating. And, and I think back to you and me in what, 2003 and four buying Evos and STIs and like being able to bargain with the dealership to buy it. Not markups, not like. Yeah. Cause it turned out people in those days didn't want these cars. Yeah. They were like, like uh, people, people and these it, days don't either. They just hold what they want and they go and they mark it up. Like they, they shouldn't have been Broncos shouldn't have sold on the secondhand market for a hundred thousand dollars. And they did. No. Tons of them did. You shouldn't be able to buy a Corvette for your $60,000 MSRP, pay another 10 grand to the dealer to buy it because the dealers are being greedy and then go put it on, bring a trailer and sell it for 125. Like that's, yeah. that, that, that to me, I mean, there's, is, is it, is there too much easy money out there? Is what, what, what is it? And, and if there is too much easy money, why don't I have it? Because it's not that easy apparently. Well, it's like when we're buying Evos and STIs, they were like back in the seventies when Plymouth had the Superbirds. Nobody wanted those. Nobody wanted Daytonas. Yeah, I guess because they were ridiculous looking. I mean, I remember and that's kind of the way the remember, that's kind of what the Evos and STIs were. I remember going to the dealership and I bought the car. It was basically secondhand. It belonged to somebody who worked at the dealership, but it had seven thousand miles on it, and it's stickered new for what thirty two five. Yeah, and I was out the door for like twenty seven and a half. The car was three months old. Yeah. So if that was today and these cars, you go out there and say, say it's sticker for 32, which it won't, it'll be over 40. Um, you go out there for 32 and put 7,000 miles on it in six months and it's going to sell for 45. Like what? I, I don't understand. It's, 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 it's frustrating as an enthusiast to see the prices doing what they're doing. I mean, just in the past week and bring a trailer results are obviously strange sometimes, but you know, they sold a $44,000 Mark two golf. Today they sold a $55,000 Saab 900. Like neither one of them were low mile brand new cars. Both of them had flaws. Like it just, the car market doesn't make sense anymore. And you know, as, as we become older enthusiasts, more mature enthusiasts, you like to think we can stop buying crap boxes and buy nice cars, but I'm not going to pay more than the value of a car for a car just because people want it to be that for some ungodly unknown reason. Now, like I'll just keep buying crap boxes. So don't want to kind of have to. So anyway, um, back to that GR Corolla, yeah. it does have a forged carbon roof, which is ugly, which is but cool. cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Oh, it's cool, but they, you can't tell me that Forge Carbon is pretty. Why? It looks pretty cool. Why does it look? I don't know, understand what the hate on it is. Forge Carbon? It's funny because they the actually... plywood of carbon fiber. They had, they had it covered with a fake carbon weave plastic. Oh, that's weird. Uh, but I guess for the, the debut models, they're going to have it off. It'll be clear coated. Oh. Hey, it looks cool. Well, I see it on like Lamborghinis and stuff, and it looks like... It's like, like I said, it's it's the plywood of carbon fiber. No, it's got aluminum in it. Is it not what I'm thinking it is? What's the fancy new carbon fiber on Lamborghinis and stuff? I thought it had aluminum dispersed in it. That's why it's forged car. It's forged carbon fiber. You put aluminum into it. It's not a weave though. It has. Uh, um, yeah, it still looks cool because it's. <laughs> 
it's real carbon and real aluminum. Yeah, I don't I don't like whatever that new car a forged composite Lamborghini. Yeah. I don't care if it's the MDF of carbon fiber. It just looks like it. It looks weird. I don't like it. <laughs> I, have you looked at one up close yet? Those new Lamborghinis? Yeah, yeah, it looks really cool. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just spoiled because I'm here just outside of Scottsdale where everybody has a Lamborghini. I see. I thought the joke thing you sent me about it, I thought somebody had airbrushed like skulls. It was a bunch of airbrushed skulls. No. That's what it looked like in the picture. Yeah, the- <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, that would definitely be ugly. No, this is the forge. It looks like dirty carbon fiber. I don't know. That's kind of cool. All right. Well, I guess we can't agree on taste. That's taste. So I I, I don't like it. Um, I love carbon fiber. I love the weave. I love the detail of it. I just, that forged composite carbon fiber stuff, I just don't. It's cool. It's very purposeful. It's probably bad. On, it probably looks junky on a dumb Lamborghini, but on the roof of the uh, crow looks pretty cool. I don't know. It just it looks like it looks unfinished to me. So. It looks better than when they just painted the roofs black on the last gen e- uh, Evos. I mean, like the final editions. There's a lot of problems with the final edition. Uh, <laughs> final edition Evos, but yeah, I don't. I'm trying to find a, a, a. I'll find a picture to show you what I'm talking about. I just don't. don't All like right. It. So, what about your? Uh, most exciting Toyotas you've got? Well, my, my thing about Toyota being the most exciting since manufacturer right now, since you're number one old man sedans. Yeah. Since your number one Toyota uh, friendship ended with Mitsubishi new friendship Toyota. No, I'm still a totally Mitsubishi guy. Uh, I've always had a, a lust or a love for Cressida's though. So um, we moving on to project car stuff. So I sure. think, I think last time we spoke, um, I had just sent the tank of the Cressida off for the radiator to the, for the radiator shop to boil to clean it out. Yeah. So I got said tank back. Um, and one thing I had not thought about was when you get that tank back, it's going to have no coating inside at all, and it's going to immediately flash rust, which it did. Right. And that's annoying. I don't know how you would keep it from not doing that. You know, you have to buy a coating. So like Eastwood makes a coating. Some motorcycle companies make coatings. But I don't want to put a coating inside the tank because I've heard too many horror stories on tanks that have like complex shapes that they won't dry in the right way. And then, you know, fuel will get under a seam or a crack and then it will start eating away the adhesion and it will wind up making your fuel fuel tank full of sediment now from the coating breaking apart. So I don't want to deal with that on this car because I want to be one and done. So I bought like a... Yeah, and I can tell you that exact thing happened on my mom's Volkswagen. Okay, so I don't want that. That's what clogged the fuel pickup on her car. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to coating. avoid that. So what we did was we took um, basically a, like a vinegar wash and we let it sit the best we could and killed as much of the flash rust as we could and then immediately when we drained the vinegar wash out of it ran water through it and then dried it very fast with the shop vac so we put so this has two giant holes in the tank one for the sending unit one for the pump uh yeah. actually not, not, not the pump one for the sending unit one for the pickup so we put mm-hmm. the vacuum the shop back in there and like tried to shake it around the best we could and anything that was still loose in there and the rusty dust would be, you know, picked up into the air and then sucked up into the vacuum. And then we turned the vacuum on reverse and plugged up all the little holes to create positive pressure and blew everything out the other hole by putting the vacuum on reverse. So now the tank was pretty clean at this point. There was still a couple little spots of surface rust, but I mean, that's not going to hurt anything. It's just that typical little surface rust now. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a water content to fuel anyway. So there's going to be moist air in the tank, you know, depending on temperatures where there's no fuel. So if the car sits, it's going to have flash rust in there all the time, right? So what we did is once we got as much out as we could, um, I took like what's basically like a fogging oil and I blocked all the holes off and I just filled the tank with this, like a, a mist fog of 
almost like a WD-40, but not. It's specifically made for this purpose, basically coating things so they don't rust. And I just sprayed it until the entire can was inside the tank. And then we just taped over all the holes and sealed them up tight so no moisture can get in there. So that's the best we did. Um, I don't think there's much more you can do. I couldn't do any of the traditional tank cleaning methods like you see on the internet where you see people take a bunch of bolts or some rocks and throw them in there and slide everything around and dump them back out again. Because the tank is, while it's an old car, it's modern enough that it has like baffles and all kinds of places where that stuff would get trapped. And I don't think that getting a couple of spots of surface rust out is worth putting a bunch of pieces of rocks that will just be there forever. <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. There's there's no right way to do it. There's just different people's accepted methods. So that's kind of where I'm at with the tank. It's ready to go back in the car now. Um, I have wired up the fuel pump. I've put the new fuel pump in because it's an external pump. I didn't connect the hose yet because the car is in the driveway right now. I've moved to jack the front of the car up so I can change the fuel filter. But when I pull the fuel filter off, I'm going to have that open line from the fuel pump to the fuel filter. And I have a, an aerosol can of carb clean and an aerosol can of fuel injector cleaner that I'm going to run through the line just to make sure it's clear. So then when that's, once that's all done, I can put everything back in, bolt it all up. I got all new hoses. The only line I'm not replacing is the line from the filter to the pump. Unless I have to, I'm not replacing that line, but I'm replacing all the other fuel lines in the car. So from the filter to the fuel rail is new. And from the pump to the tank and then all of the, you know, um, I can't think of what they call it right now. Like evap lines. That's all going to be new as well. So the entire fuel system is going to be pretty much new, save for injectors at the moment. Unless I need to put injectors in it, then we'll put injectors in it. But I wasn't going to spend 25 times 6 for injectors if I don't know I need them. So, but the guy runs... It runs when you put fuel in it. It's ready to go once the tank goes back in. I did finally find a windshield. I don't know if I talked about that yet or not. I've been told since I got the car that MX-62 and 63 windshields are impossible to find. So I was doing a bunch of digging trying to find somebody who would make a windshield. And I called a shop who says that they can make curved glass. And they do it fairly affordably. But in talking to them, they only do it for non-street-driven vehicles. So they'll make you a curved glass to fit like your side-by-side -side or your drag car or your show car or something. But if the car is driven on the street, they won't do it. So what does it make? Plate glass? Like is, no, it's, it's, film it's, in it? it's safety glass, but it's not DOT approved. Laminated? So it's it, not laminated? It, I don't know exactly what it is. I didn't get too into it, but they don't have the approval from the DOT to run it. So liability wise, they're just not going to do it. Hmm. I mean, I guess if I told them it was for a show car or something, maybe they'd, you know, they could play dumb, but I didn't think of that until it was too late. <laughs> so, however, this company was like, well, let me see if I can find you a glass. And I was like, well, you know, I've talked to everybody else says, no, they don't exist. And everybody in the Cressida community is like, nope, they don't exist. So he called me back like five hours later. And he said he found seven windshields. Yeah. In a couple different warehouses from some like old school vendor that he still owes. Hmm. So the unfortunate part is do you know what shipping costs are right now in this country? Oh, I'm aware. They are I'm absurd. So the windshield was $125. Yeah. By the time the windshield's going to get to me and be installed in the car, this is a $530 windshield. Yeah, it's like a modern windshield. It's just frustrating that it's all in shipping. The install is only 90 bucks. It's all in like crating it because you had to obviously make a crate exactly to fit a windshield. Yeah. Crating and shipping and, and everything else, it's going to cost me over $500 for a windshield for my $600 car. So 
I, I guess I could have done the thing where you <laughs> register it and then you're like, oh, I got my insurance coverage. Oh, my windshield broke, but I'm not a scumbag. So I couldn't do that. I had to, you know, take care of it ahead of time. The good news is now that I have a windshield and once the car's in the road, the car will be insured and God forbid something does happen. It's legitimate, but I'm not going to make the insurance company buy me a windshield before I even put the car on the road. So that would be some serious karma I'd be waiting for to come back at me. So I did it the right way. But the guy called me today, actually. The glass came in. I have an appointment next Wednesday. He's going to come here. He has one tech who's been installing windshields since the 70s and has experience with old Toyotas. And he's okay. going gonna to come to the to the glass for me. So All right. I'm excited. That means that theoretically the car should run by this weekend. And then by Wednesday, I'll have glass. And then I'll have to hopefully this weekend drive around the block, make sure everything works and just start fixing all the other little things. So it's it's rounding the corner, I think. We're going to have another running car pretty soon. So, good things. Speaking of running cars. Yeah. I bought another car that I alluded to in the last episode. Yeah. But I didn't talk about it yet. Uh, it blew a motor. Oh, it did? Yeah. That didn't take long. No. So... I haven't even admitted ownership of this car yet to anybody except for the uh, the wallet. But if anybody in our listening audience, hopefully in the Southwest here somewhere, has a D16A, I think it's called, D16A6. I'll have to look it up exactly again, but I think it's a D16A6. I need one. Okay. Non VTEC. 1.6 liter. Single overhead cam. Um, the. So I wasn't driving the car. I, lo- I I basically bought the car, and Naomi's son is using the car to commute while his truck's being repaired, and through no fault of his, he was driving the car to work in the morning, just in the commute on the highway, and it started skipping. So we assumed it needed a spark plug or something was going wrong, but put new plugs and wires in and the skipping didn't go away. So in doing a compression test, the number three cylinder has zero compression. Huh. So I'm not sure what happened. I haven't even gotten to tear it down and put like a, a scope down inside and look yet, but I'm assuming the worst. I mean, best case needs cylinder head, right? So... I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Timing belt's not broke. Didn't seem to jump time. Everything else is fine. It just, it ceased to make compression in the number three cylinder. So obviously no compression, no bang, no bang. It sounds like it's skipping. It is skipping. So the car is unfortunately down before I even announced that I bought it to anybody yet. I haven't even posted a picture of this car. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a D16A6. That's what I need. So it looks like it came in a variety of cars. Unfortunately, it's not the most common of the D series engines. It came in the 88 to 91 Civic SI, CRX SI, and Civic EX, which is the top of the line four-door Civic, and the Civic Wagon four-wheel drive. So it only came in the top of the line Civics from 88 to 91. So if the car is not an SI, an EX, or a four-wheel drive wagon, it did not come with it. So it's a little harder to find because it's a 100 and 110 or 120 horsepower, 1.6 liter. So it's a good little engine when it runs good, unlike this one. So, yeah. A little bummed, but we shall move on, right? I guess so. When you buy a cheap car, I guess you always expect something to go wrong. Mm-hmm. You don't expect the engine that sounded just fine to fall apart, but, you know, such is life. Mm-hmm. The car doesn't have, the car doesn't seem to be like a car that was beaten. You know, it was a, it's a clean title, 91 Civic. Uh, it has no history of anything being done. It was all bone stock. So it's weird that 
you know, 130,000 mile Honda engine would let go, but it did. So now it is replaced. So if anybody has access to one of those, let me know. Again, I could motor could come apart. It could just need to have, you know, the valves taken care of and the head resurfaced or something. But in the meantime, it's not like number one priority because I'm trying to stick to one project at a time. And I don't want to get too deep into things until the Toyota's done, or at least done enough to be driving. So, those are my project car updates. Andrew, what do you get? So, we uh, discovered something over the weekend. Sure. Um, I had a Outlander Sport rental car on brand, and I, yeah, and I noticed it's actually the last Outlander Sport I had. And I think the Eclipse Cross had them too. But Mitsubishi has been using these rubber and plastic hatch bumpers for apparently the last 30 years. Because the same ones are very similar to the Eclipse ones. No, they're the the exact same ones. Right. So they're saying they looked very similar. So it it caused us to do a little more digging. Yeah. Um, So yeah, on an Eclipse hatch, first gen, the hatch is really heavy and they usually squeak now. Because it's yep. old. Like, I remember mine squeaked forever. Um, yeah, we talked about the squeak, get... and you talked about changing the spoiler mounts. And I said, my hat, you, well, that... I should change the spoiler mounts too. But turns out, there's more squeak. Well, it's different. There's different squeak. It would, um, mine would always squeak, and then the sun would come out, it would warm out, and stuff would tighten up, it would stop squeaking. So in the wintertime, it would really squeak. And then I found in the parts car I had, I noticed the rubber bumpers, the plastic ones on the top had two shims on each side. Okay. And I was like, huh. So I, I put those that, onto my car I wonder if that was and it TSB. tightened everything up. It probably was a TSB. Yeah. And it tightened everything up and mine stopped squeaking. Um, but then I've noticed now that the rubber has like pushed out Maybe because of the shims. Yeah, they have almost little like, rubber like, fins. These like little fingers are exactly. It looks like a heat sink almost with these little fins that come on the top. <laughs> yeah, and they're all squashed down. Right um, like I remember putting grease on them years ago to try to get them not to squeak, but that didn't help either. So anyway, it turns out you can buy them brand new. Like yeah, they still make they them. Still make them. Yeah. Uh, it yeah, was we, like we, 20, we considered stealing them bucks. off the rental car to put it on my car, but then we decided that would be good because they were only like four dollars each. <laughs> yeah. But it was funny because I rode in Tony's car and it was making the same squeaks. And I was like, I was in my, I had my rental car down there. I was like, I can show you when we get back what's squeaking. So he ordered some too. And he, he sent me a picture of wherever he got them from. They're literally new old stock ones. Okay. Like, like the old, old labels. Oh, that's cool. I was like, that's funny. Cause mine came, I got mine from parts work and they're like brand, brand new. new labels on them. So I think I'm going to try them without the shims first. Yep. See if they squeak and then add shims as needed. Yeah. Well, we noticed that in my Eclipse, because we actually took my Eclipse to, I drove it to California to meet you there to, to jump ahead a little bit. Um, and we took it into the, uh, the Malibu Canyons we were in. Yeah. So we were up in the Malibu Canyons and you noticed that the squeak was pretty evident and you could tell that it was specifically when going from a transition like left to right, right to left, that it made the most squeaking. So we checked yeah, bodies flexing. Yeah, we checked my spoiler, and the spoiler itself was actually pretty tight. So I don't actually need the clips for the spoiler, but we decided that it was going to be these these tailgate bumpers that were actually causing the squeaking in the back of the car. So yeah, yours are pretty squished out. Mine too. are pretty worn out too. I yeah, so I think your car had shims. My car had shims on one side, maybe. I don't remember, but I we looked at, we talked about it so many of them. I don't remember now at this point, but yes, it may have had shims, and that's why I said was probably a TSB where they added them as they wore when the cars were still under warranty. So I have yeah. to, I have to order them as well. I just I parked the car when I got back. I packed it in the driveway, threw a cover on it, and haven't touched it since. So <laughs> Yeah, my only complaint there's the car has some rattles that if you took care of the rattles it would be a lot nicer. My car? Yeah. Yeah, well I know what most of the rattles are. It's just getting to them. You know, I, I replaced all the suspension parts because the upper the upper strut mounts were deafening. So I didn't know how many other rattles there were until I replaced that. Yeah. But the, the biggest issue with my car, I think it's mostly like control arm bushings and stuff are a little worn. Yeah, probably. 
and that rear brake rattle. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. It's the the front control arms yep. are pretty noisy. Yep. And then the hatch clinking back and forth. Yep. But but the car, honestly, like it's one of the best eclipses any of us have ever owned, probably. You know, based on reliability and distance driven and what it's taken and asked for more. Like the cars I've I've literally driven that car probably twenty thousand miles since I bought it. And well, that uh, much, huh? Yeah, well, because I mean I bought it in Alabama. I drove it from Alabama to Boston. I drove it from Boston to Phoenix. Then I drove it from Phoenix to Austin. Austin to Phoenix. Phoenix to San Francisco. San Francisco to Phoenix. And now Phoenix to LA and LA back to Phoenix. And then in between, hmm. I've driven it a ton around here too. So, yeah. I mean, I, I would somewhere between 15 and 20,000 miles if I looked at, you know, my records. And I think it returned what? 32 miles per gallon on the trip home. Something like that. Like that's the day we spent beating on it in the Canyon roads. I mean, I wasn't like, I'm not going to say I was driving like a race car, but I was definitely driving it heavier than normal. Right. And we're climbing these pretty steep grades and the car is tacking out pretty high. <laughs> and I still, <laughs> even on that tank of gas, probably 24 miles to the gallon. So the car is, it's fairly efficient to drive. So that's actually, I guess we can talk future news for that car. <laughs> that car is going yeah. to be taken off of my vintage car insurance policy and become my daily driver, I think. So one of the problems the car has, other than those couple of rattles, is the wheels are typical Mitsubishi wheels, and they don't hold air. I have to, if I park the car for more than 24 hours, I have to put air in two of the tires. While driving the car, it stays pretty pretty pumped up but it's when you park the car for a long time so the wheels are pretty dinged up pretty nasty looking so i'm gonna buy a set of wheels for it when i put it on the road daily too so why don't you just run the ankies you already have because they're in my studios. your old talent because they're in my studios. yeah but the amount of money that you'd spend on new wheels you could just ship those andrew i want new wheels okay okay fair enough all right thank you <laughs> i could say the same thing to you why are you trying to buy new wheels for your track tires you have wheels because you want your wheels. Yeah. Well, I, I need another set for a different set of tires. Right. Well, I'm, I'm going to buy a set of the, uh, Renal Aero eight Aero 16s. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Those would be pretty cool. Yeah. It's going to it cost, it's going to cost less than having the wheels I have refinished. So, and even the wheels that I have back in Massachusetts would need to be refinished too. Yeah. Also, they're not really in style anymore. <laughs> they're a very late 90s, no. early 2000s wheel. If I had a blue talon, I'd run them just for, you know, nostalgia. But I think that uh, if I, I'll eventually have them here and I'll have them as a spare set for the car. But for now, I'm going to run the, I'm going to buy a set of the Renal Aero 16s in the black and silver finish. I'm All right. Really so speaking of the so, money on it. Yeah. So speaking of the canyons, um, we did some stuff before we went to the canyons. We did. So we'll back up a little bit. <laughs> Um, cars and coffee at All Makes Welcome yep. in Long Beach. Highly recommended. Yeah, it was very cool. Yeah, you said the burrito um, was delicious. The coffee was delicious. The crowd was pretty rad. Yeah, so it's commodity coffee. It's a coffee shop, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it's the owners that do All Makes Welcome. I don't know who organizes it. It's we start on Instagram. I'm assuming it is. It has a very Similar vibe to the four till four show here. Yeah, it was a pretty exactly. good variety of cars. There was no like elitist attitude. It didn't seem everybody seemed like sure. There's a couple of Porsches parked out front, but there's also a couple of there's a rest in peace. There was a Saab nine thousand parked there that was beautiful. And you know, by the end of the day, there was a variety of everything from vintage Japanese to eighties German to that was pretty much it. There wasn't much modern there, was there? There was maybe. One E92 and one nine nine one or nine nine seven or something. It was a pretty pretty vintage gathering, I think. Yep. So we did that. We weren't and the then, only um, there either. There was a Galant VR4 there. Mm-hmm. So that was cool. I think his Instagram name is Pi VR4. Yeah, because it's the car is 314. That makes sense. I didn't put that together. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's yeah. card number three fourteen. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a ninety one. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, I think it's a ninety two. It's a second. Yeah, it's ninety two. Yeah, I always in my brain always puts ninety as the first year. Maybe because of Eclipse Talon stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's a ninety two car. Yeah. So yeah, that we did that, uh, and then actually we went to the. It's kind of. I don't know. It was okay. It was the, the heck is the name of the, that fancy. Oh, period. Correct. Yeah. Period. Correct. Cars and coffee. Don't, yeah. Period. Lame. I don't support the period. Correct. Business model, but I will say that their store is rad looking. Yeah. They had a nine, six, two in there, which is kind of crazy. I don't understand. I don't, yeah, I don't get it. Yeah. I, it's like some really expensive clothing with like kind of boring designs on it. Yeah. And some old uh, used books. Yeah. Overpriced metal toolboxes. I, I understand why their stuff's expensive now, seeing their location in their shop. Like, sure. Definitely a boutique kind of thing. Like, it's, I don't know if it's a Southern California thing or just like a more. After it's like a Porsche culture thing. I don't know what the deal yeah, is. They're not just Porsche culture either. They have other stuff. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I didn't see anything there. Like, I don't want to say that I couldn't afford, but like nothing that I would spend the kind of money on that they were asking. None of it was worth what they were asking. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, like the little folding toolbox was what, like $300? Something insane like that. And it's like the old school, like, the metal lunchbox style toolbox. They're annoying toolboxes to use. That's why nobody uses them anymore. Because all your tools bang around in them. Yeah. <laughs> like you go buy a tool bag. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> Unless you want to look like a tool bag and you buy a metal toolbox. Yeah, I guess. But it's, it was pretty dumb. Yeah, it I'm was, sorry. It was, it was a little annoying because we got there and there were some spots that were blocked with cones, but nobody was like, all right, you can park here. And then we drove up to like the main entrance and the guy's like oh you're not in the list you can't come in and I was like alright that's fine like whatever the Eclipse isn't exactly like the world's nicest car it is what it is I, I understand not being a featured car but then he's like well there's some spots with cones back by the front you can park there so we're like alright we saw those we went back and then other people were already parked there so I don't know if like they knew or if somebody saw their car and was like oh yeah you're here for the show you can park here so there was some overflow parking on the top of the parking garage, which actually wound up being kind of neat because it was kind of a cool photo op afterwards. But yeah, I, I there wasn't much there that was worth looking at as far as the car show goes. Like, I'm not sure what it takes to be the exclusive members there or invited in. There was like really it wasn't nice, worth the drive. Yeah, there was a nice 911. There was a nice 356. And there was some ratty drift cars and a new Corolla hatch that's not a GR on <laughs> random Thunderbird random old guy and a 57 Thunderbird like it just was a it was a weird mix the vibe wasn't like inviting um and then the like I said the storefront inside like I wanted to see it and I'm glad I went in because the 962 was awesome it's, it's literally the shell sponsored 962 it's like the car I have models of here that was you know, driven by Hans Stuck that was cool but and their little slot car track they have set up in there, which you can't use, but it's a super fancy one thirty second scale with real nice stuff. It was neat to see, but overall the vibe was just weird, and I didn't feel welcome. <laughs> so we're like, "All right, we're uh, gonna grab some food somewhere here and get out." So can't recommend that one. I, actually, until you just brought it up, I forgot we went there. Yeah, exactly. I almost forgot too. Yeah, because this just wasn't we're worth talking it. about all makes welcome, which was awesome. And then yeah. you're like, and then we went over to, and I was like, no, Andrew, in my brain, I was like, that was the next day. That was the afterwards. No, but you're right. It was afterwards. You went there. I forgot about that. Yeah, not worth it. Not worth traipsing across LA. And it's funny because the two modern cars that are at all makes welcome were in the featured parking when we got there at the period. Correct. Well, yeah. Yeah, I've never understood the, the period uh, model. It's one of those, I guess, not everything's for us, right? So that's one of those things. Uh, yeah, if you want to overpay for dumb things, go for it. That's what the world is built on. 
yeah. Go back, go back to earlier in our conversation about dealer marks yeah. on the new cars. There's a ask for every seat. Yeah, so, there's a torso for every um, overpriced t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So then we're like, yeah, screw that. We had some lunch. Or we didn't have lunch. We had like a snack. Yeah, there was a um, Whole Foods or something there. So we grabbed a, a snack. So, uh, so yeah, we ran some When games. in California, Andrew. Uh, um, I got Whole Foods all the time. I know. <laughs> Um, we just talk about how we're not elitist. Don't admit that. Come on now. That's it's kind of it's kind of over. It's owned by Amazon. Is it really, it's not really hipster anymore? No, yeah. Um, like so yeah, Aldi. Weird, right? <laughs> the um, I don't remember. I only remember the one, the name of the one, but we're the one road, Tuna Canyon. Oh, say you're not supposed to say names of the roads, Andrew. All our thousands and thousands of people will be there next weekend. Yeah, I think people know this road anyways. <laughs> yeah, there were a bunch of cool roads we drove up, and all of them interconnect somewhere. I remember because you were super annoyed because the first road you wanted to drive up, we got there, and it was a dead end. And you're like, I don't know, screw it, let's go home. <laughs> and I was like, no, there's got to be a better place to go. So I literally just Google searched canyon roads in the area and uh, found some other ones. And eventually it wound up reconnecting back to that road we wanted to drive, and that road was super, super cool. It's cool because it, yeah, is it was really cool. So when you're going the other way, you know you're not going to run into a car coming up because the car, the road is so narrow that it would be a disaster. Like, yeah, there was some dudes doing downhill skateboarding on it, which was pretty insane. So, I've seen some insane car rally stuff. That was one of the more insane things I've seen. Yeah. On a road. So they're at the top of the hill when we got there and we went down and we caught up to this car. So we pulled off on a big pull off area. And we're like, let's just wait for this car to get to the bottom so we can have a nice run to the bottom. So we were kind of walking around taking pictures. And then I kind of heard like some hooting and hollering coming down the hill, followed by like the sound of obviously skateboard wheels. And yeah. all of a sudden this dude pops around the corner at, I don't even know, he must have been doing 40 plus miles an hour. He was had to be hauling. He was going so fast on a skateboard that the car that was chasing him videoing was breaking traction in the corners. It was like an MKZ or something. Was, yeah, it was a Ford Fusion. Like, yeah. It was a Ford Fusion. It was yeah, a like, performance car, but still, it was literally no. breaking traction. It was understeering into the turns. And like you could you could hear that more than anything else. The tire is just like giving up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. The car was in like full dive going around the corner because the car was doing... I, again, this is a corner that I probably took in the Eclipse. I would have taken it like 35. And this guy <laughs> in this Ford Fusion with, you know, mismatched all seasons is doing 50. So with three teenagers hanging out of it with cameras, <laughs> it was pretty, it was a pretty rad scene. It was very cowboy. Yeah, yeah it was all a pretty right. rad scene. Uh, do you remember what the name of that skateboard company was? Because they we got to the bottom and we were like, hey, guys. And then I was wondering if they were going to be like, oh, man, and they yelled at us for something stupid. We were like, no, that was super cool. <laughs> Where can we see this video? Do you remember the name uh, of it was? I, I, uh, hold on. Let me see. see, see. Uh, I saved it, I think. Oh, okay. Or I did a, or I took a picture of it, like a screen grab. Because I think it was. It was so long ago, and I was not in my my recent history Here it anymore. Is. Madrid Skateboard Madrid Factory. Skateboards. Yep, that's what it was. So they're doing a video, uh, full, a full feature length one, I guess they said, that's going to have that footage in it. So that should be, that should be super cool to watch. Weird. So watch that video and then see us on like the halfway down part. <laughs> Must have been around for a while. Cause yeah, shaping skateboarding since 1976 as seen in Back to the Future and Stranger Things TV. That's cool. In, in the USA. Yeah, their Instagram Madrid account is Madrid Skateboards, all one word. So, yeah, I, f I followed them after after that, so we can keep an eye out for that video because it's definitely cool. And again, halfway through the halfway through the downhill, you're going to see us just standing on the side of the road, just probably like mm -hmm. jaw on the ground because we were so surprised at how fast they were moving. I've never been good at skateboarding, so I can't imagine being great at it. It's, <laughs> my, my balance has never been good enough. So, Then the next day, 
we were like, all right, let's do another Cars and Coffee, right? Yeah. So we did two more. I don't remember the name of the first one. I'd tell you not to go because it was pretty lame. But we got up super early and we went over to this one that was on the beach. Because yeah. the pictures of it looked cool and some cool stuff has, was there in the photos. And it was that it had a fairly old school vibe to it. Plus it was on the beach. So that's kind of like an iconic scene right there. Like a bunch of cars lined up along the boardwalk, right? Mm-hmm. We got there and it was basically a Mark 6 and 7 GTI meet. Yeah. Which, again, whatever. It's fine. Do your thing. But I don't didn't have any interest in stopping. So we kind of just pushed on through and kept going. And we went to the Sonke Blue Social. Mm-hmm. It's a S-O-N-K-E-I. Sonke Blue Social is their Instagram name. They do an event. I think it's going to be once a month. But that was a super cool event. I uh, had tons of vintage Japanese. I posted on my Instagram page some pictures of oh, the rotary car. We skipped a part. What did we skip? We found out about this because... Oh, we went to the we rotary meet the night before, which is also kind of a bust. Because there were only like yeah, five it was cars. cold, apparently. It was, it was quote unquote cold. It was 65 degrees and nobody came out because yeah. of California. But we did meet one guy there who was super cool. He chatted with us for a while. Didn't make fun of us too bad for being there in a Mitsubishi. It was, no, again, but he's like, yeah, come out to this other event. Yeah, and he told us about the, the Sonke Blue social event. So it's because of him that we found it. And then we got there the next morning, and all he remembered from us was that we were both originally from Boston. So he was like, hey, Boston. So <laughs> at least he remembered us. He was a cool guy. He drove an RX-8 that seemed pretty uh, pretty well sorted, actually. It had a very purposeful stance, nice wheels, tires, spoiler, or wing, I guess. It was kind of a neat RX-8, but there was a huge rotary crowd there. There were, what, three RX-3s, an R100, a couple of Datsun 510s, some real, like, Wangan-style Hondas, a couple of lowriders, <laughs> pretty much every style, some hot rods, some 16-year-old kids in an AMG G wagon being dumb. And everybody ripping them on it. Yeah, so. and they got made fun of pretty hard for that, so that's pretty good. I th- I think yeah, going way back to the beginning of the episode, I think that's how we take back car culture. Public shame. Yeah. Right? I mean, how is he going to do it? Tell tell the people they're being dumb. These guys, they stopped in the middle of the show, and then they loaded up the torque converter, and I assume it's got a torque converter in those, right? And uh, anyway, I don't know what they, it is. They brake boosted it and took off. And we're doing way too fast by the end of the street and completely out of control because they were 16 years old. And then another person came in in a Hellcat Charger and did some giant smoky burnout across the street and then came to the show and parked. And immediately people who are, I'm assuming, in charge of the show went over and read him the riot act. So public shame is how we take back car culture, I guess. But yeah, it was a cool meet. A lot of cool stuff there. We spent a good amount of time there. Uh, we learned a new phrase. Oh, federal. Federal. That's federal. You don't say that's criminal. You say that's federal. <laughs> yeah. But now, I forgot about that. Now that we have used it, no, it's over. It's over. Sorry, guys. We ruined your phrase. It was funny because all the cars were parked along. You know, it was a parking lot. And there was like, I'd say, maybe a six foot wide strip of grass between the parking lot and the street. Yeah. Yeah. And all the cars are parked up against it. And all of a sudden, the sprinklers came on. And we're not talking about, like, a little bit of water. It was, like, a full-on, like, soaking of all the cars with their engine bays open and their roofs open and their doors. And it was a disaster. And everybody was like, oh, no, what? Oh, it scrambled to get their cars. And this one guy just behind us, he goes, man, that's federal. <laughs> and yeah. it struck us quite funny. Uh, so... Sorry to ruin it for you, but I've now said that's federal a few times. So it's my new it's my new favorite uh, youth culture appropriation word. Taking it away. Sorry, youths. Sorry, fellow youths. Yeah. That kind of wraps up our trip to California, or at least our trip together to California. I didn't do much else after that. I kind of, I think we got lunch and I got in the car and. I had it home and I was, yeah. I was home before dark. It was actually pretty good. Yeah. Like five-ish hour drive home for me. 
that's when I went and hang out with Tony after that. Yep. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, then during the week I'm working and I, there was a, on Instagram, I saw there was a show at the Fujiwara Tofu Cafe, which is supposed to be from Initial D. Sure. And it was like 30 minutes away. It was like, oh, like a drifty type show hosted by Larry Chen. And I was like, all right, that sounds cool. Sure. Um, so we ended up, I, I went out with work people for dinner, so I didn't get out of that to like eight. And this thing went from like seven to 10 or something. It was like 40 minutes away. It's traffic. I'm like, all right, cool. Let me run over there and see what it looks like. It was a disaster because <laughs> maybe because there was an hour left, but it was like, I don't know. It was not for me. <laughs> it was not my scene. I, I don't, again, I probably what was happening I think, in the parking garage. Yeah, but it was just, yeah, just too many people um, just kind of not just like average cars nothing really special i think you sent me a picture um, of like a, a Cosca sedan yeah it's it was like just not it was i don't know it's like it felt like um like what i said earlier with the old mass tuning meets that were at night sure it was the early kind of devolved into just days. chaos yeah. yeah and um yeah, you know what? I I decided that the morning meets is where it's at. Yeah, because I you know I'm not old, but but yeah, exactly. I'm just I'm at an age where I want to get up, I go have a coffee, and then I go do the rest of my day. Yep. Um, and uh, I don't need to spend all, all night out with uh, your fellow youth cars anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I was talking not... I was talking to a friend out here, uh, also a fellow Cressida owner, and we were having a very similar conversation offline. And I think that we're both at a point where we're moving forward with this. And I don't know if you want to try to do it out there too at the same time, but you're more than welcome to. We're going to start doing an invite only, once a month gathering. It's going to be at a different location each month. It's going to be. 10 to 15 people to start and it's going to be like a local coffee shop. Like we'll meet at like coffee zona and then we can hang out there for a little while, drink some coffee, be customers. And if we want to organize a drive afterwards, we can organize a drive afterwards to go up, you know, maybe a mountain road somewhere here or get to your cruise together. If not, you can go home and be with your family and totally optional. And my plan is to do it at a different place every month so that sometimes it's going to be a 10 minute drive from your house. And sometimes it might be a 40 minute drive, but Come out, hang out, have some coffee with friends, talk cars, maybe do a drive, maybe don't, but just be invite only, at least at first, probably forever. You know, if you know, you know, kind of deal. I I think we're going to pilot it out there. Okay. Because it's my corporate speak. We're going to do a pilot on it Um, because that way we can kind of get the pictures and, and show the feel I, of what we're going I for. I think you can do it out there too. If you just invite some of our friends, like we, we, we've been lived there your whole life, you know, some people we can promote it for the same day. We've the same weekend and you know, it'll be an Maybe. East coast, East coast know, event and a West people, coast event. But we'll find out. I think you do. I think you do. You've been doing this car thing for a long time, Andrew. You know, a lot of people. So, and most of our listeners are on the East coast just because that's where we started this. So we definitely have quite a few people that I think would participate in that. And, you know, just based on, just based on a group chat that we're in, you'd have at least four or five people in your first, your first event. So that's all you need. We're not, we're not looking for a huge crowd. We're looking for, you know, 10, maybe 15 people tops just to make it a, 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 a casual gathering of just like-minded individuals. So, yeah. And I say invite only, if you're listening to this, consider yourself invited. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm pretty, pretty um, sure that all of our listeners won't show up and have it become no. literally 20s of people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we've got a name for it. We're going to work on a little logo. Yeah, we're working on some stuff. And um, we'll go too corporate with it, but it'll be like, like I said, it'll be a little, if you know, you know, kind of deal. Yeah, well, you gotta have, you gotta have something ready to, to like brand it a little bit if you need to. Sure. So. Something to sell it to the coffee shop. Why are there 15 cars here? Well, this is us. We're going to buy coffees. If you have breakfast, we'll probably buy that too. We're just customers. Yeah. This is our meeting point. And I think that that's something wrong with that. Yeah. I think that that would be, 
I think that's kind of the scene I'm looking for now. You know, not this big crowds. I, I like the morning shows because they're usually a more low key crowd, less, uh, less drama, less issues. I mean, I, I think I talked about it on podcast a couple weeks ago. I even went to like a typical, like, and to use a 2020, 2022 catchphrase word, a, a boomer car show, you know, a typical Saturday night cruise night. And they were, I don't know. I like the paths. <laughs> oh, and, and it's great. It's a, it's a good time, but it also devolves towards the end to the point that the police have started throwing you out of there at eight o'clock uh, because it's devolved in the end. And that's the same thing. It's that same crowd that comes out after nine, nine to 10 and the two step cars come out and the neon lights are flashing and burnouts happen and drifting happens and fights happen. And, but anyway, I, I went to one of those typical, you know, Saturday night shows and I watched two or four, I should say it was a group of like 55 to 60 year old men literally fighting about a parking spot. They, oh, they were they were arguing unexpected arguing about a parking spot, like to the point where they had to be like pulled apart from each other. So one of them was mad because he wasn't allowed to park there, and he's like, "No, you can't park here because you're not in our club." And it's like it's first of all, it's an open parking lot at a furniture store. Like, relax. <laughs> Second of all, you all drive identical Dodge Challengers. Double relax. Like, relax. What was, what was Frank's gang and it's always sunny? Is it like that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Club. Yeah. You said, Dodge, I said Dodge Challenger. And you said Frank's gang. I thought you were talking about our friend named Frank who has a Dodge Challenger. And I was like, what? Frank had a gang? <laughs> <laughs> but I get where you went with that. So never mind. But no, it was definitely, it was definitely a weird scene. And I, I just don't need that in my life. I just, I, I enjoy car life, right? Just yeah. relax, have a good time. We're not out to win races. We're not out to win car shows. We just enjoy cars. We enjoy working on them. We enjoy talking about them. We enjoy hanging around other people that have the same interests. And ultimately, we enjoy driving them. So I think we just need to promote that culture. You know, I was talking to this friend out here whose name is Mark. Um, he also said he's also a Crested owner, but he was talking about his father's Volkswagen club back in the day. And he has the same thought that you or I have about clubs. Like, we're not going to start a car club. We don't want a car club. No. It's not our thing. We don't want politics. We don't want dues. We don't want any of that stuff in a club. But he was talking about his father's Volkswagen clubs back in the days and the stories his father tells from like the 60s and 70s. And I'm sure that the stories are told with, you know, the rose colored glasses, but talking about how they'd have a Volkswagen event, like just this past weekend here, we had Buggerama. And the night before Buggerama, all the dudes in the club would all hang out at one of the dudes' houses and clean their cars and prep their cars and work on one guy's car if it needed help getting done. And that's just kind of the vibe I'm looking to build minus the club aspect. Just if you know, you know, you're in this group, we do cool car shit. And if you want to come great, if you don't want to come great, just be cool. And that's kind of where I'm at. Right. And that's, that's how we're going to take back car culture. We're going to be that group that just is, I don't want to say we're respectful and great to everybody because we're not trying to be respectful and great to everybody. We're just trying to enjoy our hobby without drama. And I think that's what we need to need to look for. So. Yeah. Speaking of good events like that, I, I went over last Sunday. Um, Revival Motoring Podcast had their donut meet down at their headquarters. Excellent. Which again is a, if you know, you know, you're, you're welcome to come. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, that was cool because it, they already had one, but it was kind of colder, so we didn't go. But this one was a little warmer. I met our buddy Chris down there. He brought his Delica. You brought the Montero, right? I brought the Montero because my son wanted to ride in it. He never had he before. hadn't ridden yeah. it yet. <laughs> no. And um, it wasn't old enough and now because he can sit forward now, yep. face forward right. in the seat, so it's it's more fun. Plus, he walks um, by it every day in the driveway, and he points at it and says, Dad's truck, right? So you got to yeah. take it for a drive. So he's got the new hot wheels toyota fj80 okay which looks like a montero sure to a two-year-old i can see that's, that. that's a beige colored suv that's, that's data truck yeah. so well he's got the gray one he's got the tan one now i found the tan one in california i brought back for right. him so he's got two and uh yeah he couldn't stop talking about what riding in the truck it was funny it's awesome so it's all about he's very excited and he really liked the sunroof because he could see airplanes through it excellent <laughs> so 
and you let them sit in it and turn the wheel and stuff. So excellent. See that that's that's what it's all about. That's the kind of that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But anyway, so you had the four wheel drive Mitsubishi contingent at the donut meet. Right. So that's cool. I saw some pictures. It looked like a good time. I know I've been to one of those with you last summer and it was pretty fun. It's also it's that same kind of vibe where it's just like everybody's friendly, there's no attitudes, and it's just cool people doing cool stuff. So I support that completely. I went to, Do you need other I went to a little bit douchier of a Saturday morning show. There's an event here put on by a company called Highline Autos, which I'm not sure what they yeah. do. I'm not sure if it's a dealership or what, but they have a magazine and they do this Highline Autos at High Street. So High Street is like an outdoor mall kind of thing. It reminds me of for people that are from the Northeast, like you, the, uh, what's that one in Linfield? I can't think of the name of it. What, Market, Market Street? Market Street, yeah. It's that kind of a place. Like it's higher-end stores, higher-end restaurants, outdoor open-air mall shopping. But anyway, so mm-hmm. once every first Saturday, they do a Highline Autos at High Street. And it's uh, invite-only kind of. But you can also like email them and be like, hey, I have this. I want to bring it. Can I? So Wednesday night before it, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to send pictures of my car and see if I can park there. And they said yes. So I brought my car to that show. It was kind of fun. It was neat being in a little bit different of a scene. There was a Lamborghini Cyan? 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 Cyan. Cyan. (laughs) S-Y-A-N. It's one of of 63. It was also blue, so maybe just Cyan, yeah. It's Cyan. That's blue. (laughs) No, but it's S-Y-A-N. Not not all blue. It doesn't happen to be blue. There's only 63 of them. They all say number 63 on the side. And... Okay. Super valuable. You and sixty three cool. your friends. Right. So that was all of the same car. So that was there. There was a the new twenty twenty one the ESO Griffo Griffith ESO Griffith. The like Italian sports car that they relaunched last year. That they don't, I don't officially know. sell here. There was one of those. Uh there's a Ferrari two seventy five GTB that was an actual Mille Miglia winning car from nineteen fifty something. Or a sixty something, nineteen sixty five Mille winner, with plates on it, street driven the show. Like that's got to be a what thirteen, fourteen million dollar car now. That was pretty amazing. Um, it's cool. It's a neat show. It's like I said, it's it's not invite only, but it's, you kind of have to be allowed to go. Nobody checked credentials or anything when I rolled in. I was ready with like the email saying I could be there, so maybe you can just go. I don't know. It's not super in. It's not a super inviting vibe, but it's not. It's not something I'm going to go to every week with my car. You know, it was a bit more high stress and a little more less relaxed than I like a show to be to participate in. But I do generally go to take pictures because there's always some cool stuff there. The following day, there was a show here for motorcycles called the Front Row Moto Show. And it's a pretty big deal, I guess. It's a custom motorcycle show. And it runs the gamut from dirt bikes to cafe bikes to bobbers and choppers and anything in between that doesn't fit a style. And that was super cool. It was very, it was very laid back. It was very low key. They had this food court area that they took all the tables out of and they put the motorcycles and display in that food court area, but all like the little food vendors were still open. So you could get, you know, good food and walk around and there were some tables around the edges there were some, you know, famous motorcycle companies were there selling their goods. I know that uh, that Go Fast Don't Die company that was they were there. Yeah. The do you remember the girl from the TV show on like the Motor Trend Network, the Girl Gang Garage or whatever, All, All Girls Garage. Yeah. So she had her little setup there with a car they built, or a truck they built, and if you go to our Instagram page, you can see it. It's like a 1955 Chevy pickup with a oh, M5 okay. V8. <laughs> like super rad build. And they built that car that was there. And she was there talking about that. And there was it was a neat little like the aesthetic was awesome because there was the part in the food court. And then across the way, there was a, another part of the show was in a, a 1950s, 60s style garage 
like a service garage that's vacant and it was just all emptied out and they had vendors in there. They had more show bikes in there. They had a guy like playing live rockabilly style music because it was motorcycles. They had an actual like full tattoo studio set up in the office of the, of the garage. And like they were doing tattoos on the spot. There were pinstripers there. They were a couple of cool, like period, very period, correct. Hot rods, like a 29 Ford and a 32 Ford. Uh, it was, it was a super, super rad, super rad show. And it just made me really, uh, really want to get back into a motorcycle again. <laughs> I already did. And going to this didn't help. But I think I put some pictures of that on both pages. I know on my Instagram page I did. And I think I might have on the auto off topic page or I might have just put pictures of the truck. But I have plenty of shots and I'll be sure to post some more as the week goes on. Because there was some, there was some really neat builds there. And actually I didn't even know this, but. I'm sure that you've seen me post that yellow Cressida around here. The other MX-32, like my blue car. Yeah. Uh, he also has a super cool Triumph build that he had on, like almost like debuted at that show that I had never seen, like a 60s Triumph bobber style motorcycle. Very cool stuff. Um, the the scene here is just, it, uh, there's no words to describe it. The amount of cool stuff here is amazing. And Unfortunately, it's coming into the warm season here, so it has to slow down a little bit. But that's why I think it's going to be a perfect time to start this kind of low-key event with just friends who know. So, Cool. Yeah. I think that's it. So, yeah, just one quick upcoming event note. Southern New Hampshire Cars and Coffee at uh, London Area Speedway is this Sunday, the 10th. That should be interesting to see how that goes off. Uh, yeah, it's $10 to enter. They take cash and Venmo and And before you um, say no, it's ten dollars. It's ten dollars because it's inside a racetrack and they track. Yeah, a little little quarter mile short track. Yeah, the the um, racetrack race is mile. requiring it, I think. So, yeah, it covers their insurance and yeah. stuff. But we'll see, we'll uh, see how it goes. Set up. Yep, Malin's got like food trucks set up and music. Yeah. So hopefully it works out so, well. Yeah, so I'll go check it out. Yeah, I've always liked that show. I mean, the idea of paying to get into a Cars and Coffee hurts, but I understand why, because it's because of the location. So I would, uh, if I was there, I would support this. You know, I always supported the old Southern New Hampshire Cars and Coffee because we like the people involved. But but on the flip side, maybe it keeps keeps the clowns away. definitely so. keep clowns out. There's no question. Yeah, I'm just worried about interactions at the door when people don't want to pay when they get there. Well, she's made it very clear on all the posts. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's actually I hope it goes well, track right? staff that takes it. That's so. that's even better. As long as they don't have to deal with it. Now, I, I wish her nothing but the best. I like Maylin. She's a good person. She has good intentions here. And like I said, I think the only reason that they're charging is because they're at an actual location now that has to have insurance to open their gates. So, hopefully, it works out. Mm-hmm. If I were there, I'd be there. I'm not, so I won't. Yeah, maybe when I'm there in May or June. We'll see. Excellent. All right, cool. Well, I think that social, makes it social media. Yeah. So as always, we're on Instagram, Odd Off Topic, Odd Off Topic Podcast on Facebook. I think just our Instagram maybe post there. I don't know. Kind of getting away from that because there's no engagement there. And nobody seems to care. I still post there. So, okay. Uh, we definitely get more on definitely more active on Instagram with a lot of off topic. So that's really the or place Twitter. to follow us. Uh, I actually don't use the account that much on Twitter. Are you talking about just, okay, I own. think I just missed what understood what you said. You said you're not posting on Facebook's auto off topic. Yeah, we don't really do that. Okay. No, 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 no. I don't do that at all. But everything we post on yeah, our Instagram exactly. goes to the Facebook anyway. Does it? It does. Yep. Okay. Maybe when I do it, I don't have it connected. I think for some reason it messes up and only lets you connect one at a time. Well, no, because it's, it's really it's dumb. connected through your account because you have, and this is off air stuff. We'll figure it out afterwards. Uh, but anyway, yes, everything yeah. I post on the Ottawa topic Instagram, I do see on the Facebook page. So anyway, follow the Instagram page. If you have Facebook, yeah, that's where it's get at. Rid of Facebook and just go to Instagram. I know it's the same company, so it doesn't matter, but Facebook's for pictures. Yeah, Instagram's oh, sorry. Instagram's for pictures. Facebook's for Drama. Drama and bad politics and pictures of your family's babies. All right. Anyway. And I am yeah, at I'm on PSI. Instagram too. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
Sorry. Go ahead. You can go. You're uh, done yet. Uh, 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 you're, uh, you're done yet. Uh, it's fine. I am uh, <laughs> at, uh, let's see. Who am I? I'm at Race and Anger on Instagram and uh, on Twitter. So there, there you go. And I am TSISS350 on Instagram. And still not on Twitter because password dumb things have happened. Yeah, sure. Such All right, cool. Old man, I can't do it. <laughs> so, oh, man, as always. Issues. I'm lying. I should be able yeah. to figure it out. For some reason, I can't. You're not old. I know I'm not old, but that. I just can't make my, Insta- my my Twitter work. I have an account. Can't make it work. <laughs> How to make password send tweets. Yes, exactly. That's what's going to happen. You're going to see that. My first tweet is going to be my password. You know, God damn it. <laughs> All right. Delete. Well, anyways. <laughs> so keep cars analog. Maybe Brad will get on Twitter and aim for the roses. <laughs>